You're listening to the Mens Rea Podcast, and this is the story of the notorious Nurse Cap. Patrick Cadden and Mary McLaughlin were both from rural County Mayo, and had emigrated to Pennsylvania in the 1890s, where they met and married. Patrick worked down the mines in Scranton, which were low-paid jobs by American standards, but were sought after for poor Irish immigrants. He was 27, and she was 28 when they married, and settled down in New Street, Scranton. They had their first child on the 27th of October, 1891, and named her Mary Ann, but she soon became known by her pet name, Mamie. Two years later, in 1893, they had another little girl, who died in infancy. This death hit the couple hard, and when Patrick's father died in 1895, the couple decided to move back to Mayo to work the family farm. This was a rapidly changing Ireland that they moved back to, particularly for rural farmers who were engaged in a battle against absentee landlords in England, and alongside that, the Irish independence movement was steadily gaining traction. By 1911, Patrick Cadden was able to buy a small holding that their family had settled on. They were no longer tenants, but owner-occupiers. They lived in a large farmhouse, and with the money they had saved from living and working in America, they opened a grocery in part of the house, and were able to extend the building and add an extra outhouse, which meant that they could house horses, poultry, and cows. In total, the couple had five children who survived childhood. Mamie was followed by Michael Joe in 1897, Ellen was born in 1899, Teresa 1900, and Eliza was born in 1906. They were slightly better off than normal small farmers, and also had a reasonably small family by standards of the time. It wasn't all easy, though. There were very poor years for farming at that time in the area. Something near to the famine hit Mayo in 1897. The kids were all sent to school, and they all learned to read and write. They spoke Irish and English fluently. They were a religious family, Catholic, like literally everyone else that they knew. Mamie, like her siblings, attended the local national school at Lahardane, and was noted as being bright and studious, as well as highly strung and strong-willed. She loved learning and didn't leave school until she was 15, which is quite remarkable given where she lived and her background. Mamie had no chance of inheriting the family farm, but when her father had purchased it from the Earl of Arran and the Land Commission in 1911, one and a half acres were bought solely in Mamie's name. This was quite remarkable, and though it wasn't a large plot of land, it would have functioned as a small dowry or a way to fund a start for Mamie away from Mayo. But so long as she remained in the family home, there would be little for her to do but assist with the homestead or to marry. For a long time, she helped with the younger children or worked in the shop, but she was frustrated there. There wasn't much for an intelligent, independent, and able woman in rural Mayo, and she knew that once Michael Joe married, she would find herself viewed as a burden by him and the new mistress of the farm. But she stayed throughout all that, through her twenties and into her thirties, holding onto the small parcel of land and staying near her father, whom she loved very much. In 1925, her sister Teresa became very ill with tuberculosis and eventually died after a nine-month illness. Mamie decided that now was the time for her to make her move. She was 34. She'd always liked the idea of nursing, particularly midwifery. The midwife was a medical professional admired and respected by all, and was often far more present in people's lives than doctors. The doctors were way too expensive for most people to afford. She liked the idea of being a pillar of the community, being respected and known by all. She was drawn to the trappings of the trade, more than through feeling a call to care for people. So Mamie and her father decided that they would sell her small parcel of land, and that that would fund Mamie going to Dublin to train in the National Maternity Hospital in Hollis Street. It was a whopping six-month course, costing £25, which is about €1,800 in today's money. She'd been out of school for a very long time at that stage, and she ended up having to repeat two exams. But she was finally enrolled on the Register of Midwives in December 1926. She set about finding work and beginning her career. At the time, the domain of midwifery was in what were called nursing homes. These were places that pregnant women could go to to receive care, give birth, arrange adoptions, and so on. They were privately owned, and so were not associated with the religious institutions that had a monopoly on all other Irish health institutions in the state. There were up to 50 maternity nursing homes in Dublin at that time. In 1927, Mamie began working at Alverno Nursing Home in Portland Row. The following year, her brother Michael Joe married the local national school teacher. It was an optimistic time. The 20s, though popped with conflict, were also hopeful as the Irish Free State began establishing itself, with 26 counties now partially independent from Great Britain, and with new leadership in place. But then, the 1929 Wall Street crash happened, and the country was plunged into recession, something that has repeated itself over and over in the last hundred years or so. 
Add that into what was becoming increasingly a more conservative and Catholic-led government with Eamon de Valera at its head in whatever form, and Ireland was becoming quite a stifling and dreary place. We've looked at women's issues in past episodes, and this is basically the start of it. People ground down by poverty, dominated by conservatism and religion. Archbishop John Charles McQuaid was a formidable figure and had a huge influence with the government. Policy that followed was basically dictated by the church. Contraception was banned, as were tampons. Family planning was discouraged. It was even seen as patriotic to have large families. Married women were banned from working in the public sector in order to create more opportunities for men, and this trend was copied in the private sector. Soon it was only low-wage positions that would be open to women who needed to work to help support their families. But in this emerging society, Mamie Cadden thrived. By 1929, she was able to set up on her own and open her own nursing home. Rich or poor, women still got pregnant and needed somewhere to go for care, and so Mamie's livelihood thrived despite harsh economic conditions. Remember, she was not into charity. She expected to be paid and paid well for the services that she provided. Initially, she found a two-story Victorian house in Ranala and established herself there. But soon she outgrew the small building and secured a loan through her solicitor Charles Boyle to buy a full terrace of houses on the Rathmines Road, which she called St. Melrun's. Along with the obvious lying-in services available in St. Melrose, where women would attend for care during labour and delivery, a number of other services were also offered. Mamie would arrange to place unwanted children with other families, for a princely fee of £50. It may have been simply a case of an unwanted pregnancy, or it may have been that the mother already had a number of children and couldn't cope with another. So Mamie would take the child and give it over to Kathleen McLaughlin, who worked out of Berkeley Street in Fibsborough, and who called herself a social worker. McLaughlin would place the babies with families who would look after them, again, for a small fee. It was entirely legal and somewhat similar to the foster system as it works today. The children would be registered under the Children's Act, and although the whole system depended on payments being made, no one was doing charity work here. At least the kids were with families. But neglect, of course, did occur. This farming out of infants led to Mamie's practice being frequented by many unmarried mothers, and with Mamie, they found someone willing to provide care, particularly if they were unmarried, pregnant, and found themselves quote-unquote miscarrying, and required care for this too, and of course if they had the money to pay her. Mamie required cash up front for treatments, or for sorting out a difficult situation. Though she was happy to treat and be paid by the women in the situations that came to her for help, she wasn't particularly sympathetic to them in general. She'd be all concern and care to their faces, and then would call them whores behind their backs. In the 1930s, Mamie's business was booming. She employed her sister and her cousin Molly O'Grady in the nursing home. She continued working and threw herself into whatever social scene she could find, She hung out with college students and was friendly with the high-profile but closeted gay men of the theatre scene in Dublin. She was ostentatious, and she drove a bright red, open-top MG sports car, which she had imported in 1934. It was incongruous in the economically depressed city. People thought it was distasteful. And to make matters worse, she was a woman. A blonde woman. There was no legalised form of adoption in Ireland until 1952, and when it was established, the legislation was closely vetted by Archbishop McQuaid. It was not unusual to find infants abandoned on the side of the road. There was a particular spate in the 1930s where babies were a bit older than would be expected and would be wrapped up warmly in good quality clothes and blankets and didn't fit what the typical abandoned babies from young scared women generally were. Mamie was suspected. But there was no evidence of this, nor was there any evidence that she was performing abortions. But she was. The women who used her services were hardly about to turn around and inform the Gardaí of that fact, though. Mamie even passed independent inspections with flying colours. She was good at her job, and she knew what she was about. 1935 saw the nearly entirely unopposed introduction of the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which made a criminal act the importation, advertisement, and selling of any form of contraception. The one voice of opposition was a senator from Trinity College, who said that this ban would lead to an increase in infanticide and criminal abortions. He wasn't wrong. But there was an accompanying crackdown by the Gardaí on the abortion services that were being quietly provided in Dublin after the introduction of the new law. Mamie's was investigated, but no evidence against her could be found. But things would not continue to go smoothly for Mamie. Eventually, mistakes were made. On the 24th of February 1938, Margaret Berkeley, a widow from the Hoth Road, found herself pregnant and took herself to London to buy ergot. This was something often used after childbirth to help contract the womb and prevent bleeding, but if taken during pregnancy, could cause an abortion. She took the ergot, but it didn't seem to do anything, so she went to Nurse Cadden's that night. Mamie was busy, though. She was off to a dance that evening and wouldn't take the woman in. The next day, when Margaret returned, she was bleeding so heavily that Mamie rang for a Dr. Percy Seeger to come help. The baby was born dead, and then for some reason buried in the back garden of St. Melrune's. Those remains would later be found in the back garden, 
And this is the beginning of rumors that Nurse Mamie Cadden had dozens of dead babies buried in her back garden. But poor Margaret's was the only one. When confronted by the guardie about it, Mamie was unrepentant and she said, quote, you cannot say that was a child. It was a fetus, end quote. On Tuesday, the 14th of June, 1938, Mamie drove to Meath, accompanied by one adult and a two-and-a-half-month-old infant. Her red sports car was spotted throughout the countryside on that warm, sunny evening. James Stoney saw the car pass that evening with two women in it, and as he turned the corner to head home, he heard a noise. It was a baby crying, and he found a well-wrapped child lying on the grass verge. He left the baby there and headed to his neighbours to tell them what he had found. Agnes Doran also did nothing, and so James headed to Dunshocklin to notify the guardie. When Sergeant Goff arrived, he picked the baby up, who was at this stage cold and shivering, and he took her home, where his wife looked after her, before being taken to Navin Hospital. The next day, when Sergeant Goff returned to the scene, pretty much everyone had remembered the red sports car, and had known that it belonged to Nurse Cadden. The officer took this information down to the detective branch in Dublin Castle. When the guardie called to the door of St. Mailrunds, Mamie told them that she had indeed been in Navin the night before, with a man that she did not wish to name. She had gotten lost on her way home and had been nowhere near where the baby girl had been abandoned. She was asked to produce the register for the nursing home, and did so. Seven babies had been born in the house in the past three months, but they found that only six had been registered with the city medical officer. A little baby girl was missing. The next day was a voting day in a general election, and as Sergeant Goff stood at duties at the polling station, he saw a red sports car with two women sat in front. When Mamie passed him again on her way back to Dublin, he hailed her and stopped the car. He asked what her business was, and she retorted, quote, What, do you think I dumped another one this evening? She laughed as she drove off. People took notice of her more closely on this second trip. They committed the unusual sight of the red sports car for a second day to memory, some taking down the number plate, and others taking a close look at the blonde woman driving and her dark-haired companion, Molly O'Grady. On the 6th of July, Mamie made a statement to the guardie, telling them that she had been up in Navin and that the person with her in the car had been a young male medical student who didn't want his name given as it may hurt his future prospects. Furthermore, she said that there was a witness who would put her assistant, Molly, in the nursing home in Rathmines that night, a typist named Bridget O'Shaughnessy, who had called by and spoken to the woman in the house that night. On the 8th of July, the guardie called back to Mamie's and seized the record books that they had been shown before. Only now, there were loose pages and it looked as if someone had tampered with them. Mamie was incensed, and she roared at them, The only bastards born in this house were fathered by guards. The guardie tried to question Molly, but Mamie would not let her speak for herself, and insisted on staying, saying that she would be a witness. She was asked to leave, and eventually she did. Molly tried to give false identity information, but eventually admitted who she was, and that she was a distant relation of Mamie's. Despite what the two women said, the guardie would not be put off. They had been waiting eight years to have the opportunity to get Mamie for abortions or child abandonment, and they were determined to follow this through. On the 11th of July, they arrived back at St. Melrose and arrested the two women. The next day, the women were put into an identity parade. Back then, witnesses were compelled to attend these, and they stood directly in front of the line of people, having to actually touch them to identify them. The people who had spotted the car and its passengers in Meath were called down to Dublin to pick out the women that they had seen. Mamie stood there with her recently dyed hair, now pitch black instead of her usual blonde, and then Molly took her turn. Even with the black hair, it should have been relatively easy to pick the women out. Mamie was all over the Daily Mail newspaper, and Molly stood there in a fur coat, just like the second woman in the car. And yet, James Stoney, the man who had first spotted the infant, failed to pick Mamie out of the lineup, but did place Molly there. In other cases, it was Molly that was not identified. The matter was first before the court on the 13th of July, in Kildare for some reason, and Sergeant Goff gave evidence and told Justice Redden in the district court that he was investigating a series of abandoned infants in the Dublin and surrounding region, and that he had good reason to suspect Nurse Mamie Cadden was involved. When asked if the sergeant was saying that there was a systematic abandonment of babies going on, he responded only that the investigation was ongoing. This made the two women look particularly bad, and they were remanded in custody. It looked as if they might be charged with a number of abandonment cases. The terrace in Rathmines was searched, and the garden was dug up. A parcel was taken from the scene. The place was swarming with Gardee. It was during this search that the remains of an infant girl had been found. Mamie told the guardie all about Margaret Berkeley in 1938 and gave them all the dates and names when confronted with the evidence. She didn't want to hand over the name, but when she did, it was easy to trace Mrs. Berkeley, who confirmed the story. By the time the women appeared before court again, this time in Dunshocklin on the 26th of July, they were front-page news. When they arrived at the courthouse, they were met by a scrum of photographers and reporters, along with members of the public, described by one journalist as, quote, well-dressed women. At this hearing, Mamie dismissed the prominent solicitor that had been defending her and hired Charles Boyle, who'd helped her with conveyancing. He assured the court that there would be a complete defence of the charges. 
Mamie was remanded into custody and eventually was allowed bail in August. By the end of the month, Mamie's family had finally come up with the money, a staggering £300. But by this time, Mamie's business and reputation were in tatters. And meanwhile, babies continued to be abandoned around Dublin. Whatever this problem was, it was much bigger than Mamie Cadden. But that was not going to stop the Gardaí and the courts from trying to bring the full force of the law to bear against her. New charges were added to the sheet, demanding money under false pretenses. Mamie was accused of taking money from women wanting their babies rehomed. The Gardaí and the court accused her of putting herself forward as a maternity nurse falsely. When asked to respond to this, Mamie just said, exasperated, well, isn't that what I am? To make matters worse, Mamie was running out of cash. Her solicitor decided that he would do no work until he was paid in advance by his client. He wanted to make sure that he saw his money, and so he contacted the Attorney General to ask that it be so ordered and an adjournment be secured until such time as he had his cash. Mamie ended up having to put St. Mailrooms on the market. Everything that she had worked for was now lost. In October of 1939, the terrace was purchased and turned into flats. Boyle acted as solicitor for both Mamie and the man who made the purchase. Convenient. Mamie went for trial on the 1st of May 1939 before Mr. Justice Black and a packed courtroom. The court heard the evidence of James Stoney and how he had discovered the infant, and from Sergeant Goff, who had cared for the child and had seen Molly and Mamie the next day in the car. He repeated for the court the do you think we dropped another one tonight comment, which was very damaging for Mamie's defence. Then evidence was given of the seven births but only six registered children in the relevant months. No explanation was offered for this discrepancy. The next day, Mamie's lawyers made her case. They were trying to argue that there was some sort of campaign against Mamie by the Gardaí, and tried to discredit the Garda evidence. But this discrediting seemed to centre around how many wives of the Gardaí had used Mamie's services, and though it potentially annoyed and embarrassed people, it did very little by way of helping make out a case for Mamie. Neither the man Mamie claimed to have been with the night of the abandonment, nor Bridget O'Shaughnessy, who was to alibi Molly, turned up at court to give evidence. It took the jury one hour to reach a verdict. The women were found guilty on both charges. A rider was added by the jury, however, to say that Molly had been, quote, unduly influenced by Catton, and asked for clemency on her part. Mamie got one year hard labour on both counts to run concurrently. Molly was given six months on both counts to run consecutively, but it was suspended on condition that she lodge a £25 bond, along with an undertaking to keep the peace for two years. Mamie was promptly removed from the role of midwives by their central board, who wrote to her while she was in Mountjoy prison, telling her of the decision. She would spend a full year there in Mountjoy. The first thing that Mamie did upon her release was to head to Dublin Castle and complain about her solicitor. Not only had they done very little for her defence, they had also failed to hand over the records and other items that had been used in evidence at the trial, which had been released back to her legal team by the state when they were done. She needed those in order to salvage what she could from the remains of her career. Mamie set herself up in a kind of paramedical field, supplying cure-alls and remedies for everything from dandruff to constipation. Apparently, constipation was a national obsession at the time. But soon, her business began to concentrate on the provision of abortions. Given that there was no contraception available and family planning was not encouraged, there was a considerable amount of unwanted pregnancies, and so her services were much in demand. She set herself up on Upper Pembroke Street, near to the houses from which the exclusive and expensive doctors set themselves up in Fitzwilliam Square. She had managed to salvage some of the equipment from Rath Mines and started working out of the basement of one of the fine houses there. She advertised her services in the evening mail paper, which was the paper of choice for younger people, as it had more entertainment, photos and colour features than the others. It also had a higher circulation than the morning papers. Her ads appeared in the medical column of the paper and looked elegant and said nothing outwardly untoward. They required a bit of deciphering to figure out what services Nurse Catton really offered. It's not quite what you think of when you hear the phrase backstreet abortionist, is it? A flamboyant woman working in a posh area of the city, advertising in the paper, and who lived a full social life, while pretty much everyone around her knew what she did. There's nothing backstreet sounding about it, really. And so that's how Mamie carried on, for a number of years. Four years later, in October 1944, Ellen Thompson found herself in a situation. She was 20 years old at the time, and a live-in maid with a middle-class family in Dundrum. She worked long hours, and had only half a day off a week, which she would usually spend with her mother, who lived in Ballantyre Cottages, a nearby council estate. When Ellen realised she was in trouble, that she was pregnant, she knew her options were severely limited. As a lower-class girl, being sent to the Magdalene laundries to have her baby and then work with no pay for however long the nuns decided she needed to do penance for her sin, that was a real possibility. And even if she did manage to be let out, her reputation, which was basically all poor people had, would be in ruins. She would never marry, and she would forever be a social pariah. So, on her half-day off, Sunday the 22nd of October, she took herself into town and rang the bell at number 21 Upper Pembroke Street. A woman in a white coat with a spiffy feathered hat covering blonde curls answered the door and said that she was Nurse Catton. Mamie was with other patients, and so Ellen waited for a short while, until Mamie called her into the office come consultation room. 
when it was established that Ellen was around three months pregnant, Mamie inserted what was known as a sea tangle tent into her cervix. Basically, this was a medical device made out of a particular type of seaweed, believe it or not, that had been dried out and would absorb water and expand when in place, dilating the cervix. It could help in labour, but if inserted while a woman was earlier in pregnancy, would often cause miscarriage. The whole procedure took less than 40 minutes, and when Ellen left, she was given instructions to gather up anything that had been expelled from her body and bring it back to Mamie to dispose of. Ellen went home and carried about her business. On Monday, she felt a bit tired, but carried on, hopeful that this meant that the sea tangle tent was doing its work. By Tuesday, Ellen felt pretty awful. She got weak and dizzy and then started getting intense stomach pains. A doctor was called for by her employers, and when she examined her patient, she realised what was going on and found the strings of the sea tangle tent in Ellen. She tried to take it out and gave the strings a tug, but they broke off. And so, Ellen was rushed to the hospital. Ellen had peritonitis, an inflammation of the abdominal wall. It was very serious, and if it had gone untreated, she could have died. Given the circumstances, the hospital notified the guardie, who came to speak to Ellen. She told the guardie that she had found Mamie's ad in a two-year-old paper that she had been using to light the fire on hearth, and that she had arrived at Mamie's without first contacting the nurse, and that Mamie had performed the procedure without first taking payment which seems a bit unlikely, given that Mamie was all about taking payment first. She did not give credit. When the guardie called to Mamie's flat, she denied having ever met Ellen, and told them that she treated venereal disease, and that was all. That was despite the accoutrements in the basement that suggested that she did in fact perform abortions. Her stuff was scattered everywhere. Unsurprisingly, she was arrested on the spot and brought back to Mountjoy. She continued to deny the charge, stating no abortion had taken place anyway, and they couldn't place Ellen in her flat either but Mamie became ill and was unable to appear before the court for three weeks. The Gardaí weren't worried. They had Ellen, who was probably terrified, seeing as procuring an abortion was also an offence with a potential 14-year sentence. She was to be their witness, and no doubt she was so scared that she would cooperate. Not only that, she had left a scarf behind in Mamie's and was able to identify it, and laid hands on Mamie herself in a lineup. Finally, Mamie made a statement and said that she had been with her cousin Patrick Martin that day, They had spent the morning together, and though he returned home around noon for his dinner, they met again at about half three and went in search of a film to watch. But all the picture houses were full, so they wandered around the city window shopping. She said they stopped into the exclusive Gresham Hotel to have something to eat, but were told that all the tables were full, and they should return later. So off they went to a pub, and they had a few drinks in the Tower Bar in Talbot Street. When they returned to the Gresham Hotel, they had dinner. The 1940s had seen a focus on closing down the abortion services that had become established in Dublin. The industry had become a rather busy one as soon as travel to England became impossible during the war, and there was a further crackdown on family planning and contraception. Dr. Ash, William Henry Coleman, Mrs. Maloney, and Christopher Williams were all major players in the provision of abortion services, and they were all targeted by the Gardaí, arrested, tried, and sentenced to hard labour in the mid-40s. It's no surprise that Mamie was also targeted in this sweep. The general feeling was of course moral outrage that such procedures were taking place in the capital city. This time, Mamie's trial was held in camera, that is, without the public present, seemingly to protect identities, though that hadn't been an issue for all the others who had performed or procured abortions who went to trial the year before. Author Ray Kavanagh posits that this may have been an attempt to keep the issue out of the news, and to avoid highlighting the fact that Ireland had a rather thriving abortion service, in order to help maintain the status quo of moral outrage, to stop hard questions from being asked, and to keep up the image of Ireland and Dublin as a pastoral, Catholic utopia where such sins were simply not committed. During the trial, Mamie was insistent that she had only met Ellen Thompson once before and had treated her for an STD, but Ellen was insistent that she had gone to Mamie for an abortion and was able to identify her furniture and equipment, equipment that was very likely used for abortions. A man from Shepherd Pharmaceutical Supplies on Marion Street gave evidence that he had sold sea tangle tents to Mamie Cadden in August of 1943. But Ellen's story was suspicious. How had she figured out what services Mamie offered from a vague two-year-old ad And why did she insist that Mamie had treated her without a prior appointment, and more importantly, without payment? Mamie was unsurprisingly found guilty on the 27th of April 1945, and sentenced to five years penal servitude the following Monday. Years later, Mamie would write in a letter that Ellen Thompson had come to her after Larry Doyle, the husband of her employer, had attempted to abort her baby himself using a hat pin. But when that failed, he had sent her to Mamie and had paid £45 for the procedure to be carried out. Of course, there's no way to prove this, but it does sound like a reasonable explanation for the problems with Helen's story, and for how she ended up with such an awful infection, from what was a fairly straightforward procedure. She certainly wouldn't be the only maid who had ended up in trouble due to her employer's husband. By New Year 1945, pretty much all of the abortion services had been closed down in Dublin, thanks to the concerted effort of the religiously run maternity hospitals, who reported any suspicious incidents to the Gardaí, who duly followed this up with prosecutions. The abortionists were all in jail. And so infanticide in Ireland became all too common. Many babies just disappeared. 
and a handful of women were seen in the courts each term charged with abandonment. Murder. The unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. A short, simple definition of a word that we're all familiar with. For most of us, murder is just that. A word or a definition that has no impact on our lives. But to some people, murder is much more than that. It's real. It's personal, because they've lost a loved one to murder. And I want to share their stories with you. My name is Mike Morford, and some of you may know me as co-host of the true crime podcast, Criminology. I'd like to invite you to check out my new podcast, The Murder in My Family. In each episode, I'll recount a single murder case and talk one-on-one -on -one with the family members of these victims to see how these tragic crimes changed their lives and where their search for justice has taken them since. Starting in July of 2018, you can find and subscribe to The Murder in My Family on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope you'll join me for The Murder in My Family. Mamie sat in prison for five years. She refused to give further names or information to the Gardaí to help further crack down on illegal medical services in Dublin. While Mamie sat in jail, the Irish Free State officially became the Republic of Ireland. She was 59 when she was released again in 1950, though as a slightly vain woman, that's, of course, not what she was telling people. She was ageing, though. Her eyesight was beginning to fail, and she had bad arthritis, not at all helped by her total of six years in Mount Joy. Despite that, she was still a fighter and found herself a one-room flat in Hume Street, just off the fashionable St. Stephen's Green. The room was tiny, barely eight foot by ten foot, but she was determined to set up shop again. There was no running water, but she had her own doorbell, and the place was easily accessible because then, as now, many major bus routes passed by on the nearby green. She had a phone and took appointments that way. She was still well known, and so didn't have to advertise. It wasn't ideal, but she was the only show in town then. She carried on regardless of her diminished circumstances and diminished health and dyed her hair blonder than ever, and was seen taking the short walk to the posh Shelbourne Hotel for drinks regularly. She made business cards. She presented herself as the same old-ish, brash, mouthy Mamie. On Friday the 8th of June, Bridget Breslin and Standish O'Grady climbed the steps up to Mamie's tiny room. Bridget was a 33-year-old dancer, and was having an affair with Standish, who was a broke aristocrat from Cork. He was also married, and had another mistress as well, busy man. And in that June, Bridget discovered she was pregnant. This was a problem. Marriage obviously was not an option, and neither was pregnancy, because Bridget was a dancer. Standish said he gave Mamie £20 at their half-ten appointment. Mamie pumped a liquid into Bridget's womb, using a Higginson syringe, which would separate the sac the baby was in from the womb, causing a miscarriage. Mamie used a mix of water and Jay's fluid, a disinfectant. That night, though, air got into the tubing in the syringe apparatus, and Bridget suffered from an air embolism, which stopped blood flowing through her heart. Bridget died within minutes, lying on Mamie's kitchen table. Mamie and Standish lifted Bridget's body down the stairs and left her on the footpath at Hume Street. She was discovered there at half-past five by a medical student named Frank O'Neill, who had digs in the same house as Mamie. An ambulance was called, and Bridget's body was taken to Hollis Street Hospital. The proximity of Mamie's flat was noted. A letter with the O'Grady crest was found in Bridget's purse, and Standish was tracked down and spoken to by the Gardaí. But the Gardaí were not able to connect Bridget to Standish or Mamie, and no charges were brought against either. Despite the reports that followed in the papers saying that Bridget had died of natural causes, people assumed what had happened to her. Now people associated Mamie Cadden with the cruel and heartless dumping of a woman's body on the street. On top of that, she was back on the Gardaí's radar, as she was the only abortionist who had been jailed that resumed that practice. They called regularly to her room, and she tried to be careful to avoid any slip-ups. Helen Phelan was a beautiful woman, even though she had suffered from TB. She was waifish, small and delicate, and yet exuberant and outgoing. After the war, she had married John Francis O'Reilly, a man that her parents did not approve of. John Francis and Helen married on the 24th of November 1946, and moved from Clifton, County Galway, to Dublin, where John ran a hotel. But he never stuck at any job for very long, and they ended up living in less-than-ideal circumstances in Bray. By March of 1955, the two had six children, and John had decided that he had had enough. So he left, and went to Nigeria, then still part of the British Empire, and got himself a job. Helen was now completely destitute. There was no welfare system in place at that time, and she couldn't go to work with the amount of kids she had. So she decided to place her kids in various religious institutions in Dublin. Then Helen moved to Preston to live with her sister, hoping to be able to save up some money and get things in order to collect the kids. She came back and forth often between Dublin and Liverpool to see her children. But Helen also used this time in her life as an opportunity to sample the things that she had maybe missed out on earlier in life. She was free of her husband and parents, and had no one that she was responsible for. And she started going out and enjoying herself. In Preston, she went to a place called the Ribble Club, and she was quite popular. It was there that she met James Wilson Byers, 
with whom she began a relationship. In February 1956, Helen suspected that she was pregnant again, and while visiting Dublin, she saw a doctor in Hollis Street Maternity Hospital that confirmed that this was in fact the case. On her return trip to Preston, she told Christy Fulton, another passenger on the ferry, very forthrightly that she was pregnant and that she would be getting rid of it. She was 33, alone, with six kids already that she couldn't take care of. She was not upending her life again. She bought quinine tablets, hoping that they would do the trick, but they didn't work. And for some reason, she decided to go back to Dublin to get an abortion. She was back in the city on the 5th of April. On Tuesday, the 17th of April, she and a friend, Christina Kyo, met and had a few drinks in Dwyer's on Moore Street. Helen was dressed smartly in a green and yellow outfit with a green beret and black overcoat and had her red umbrella with her, just in case. When the pub closed for lunch, she went to her bank. She withdrew £15 and then went and had a curry at the Palace Restaurant, the only place one could get Indian food in Dublin at the time. When the pubs reopened at four, she set up shop in Mooney's in North Earl Street with another friend, Bridget Meehan. Bridget finished up at about half five, but Helen stayed on till half six, when she made her way to O'Connell Street and hopped on a number 10 bus, which she took to Marion Row. Helen then walked to Hume Street and called at the door of number 17. Meanwhile, Mamie was also having a bit of a rough time of it. Her flat in Hume Street was rent-controlled, but the landlords didn't like her terribly much and had decided that they would raise the rent. Either Mamie would leave, which would be great, or they would get more money, also great. Gertrude, the landlady, and by far the more persuasive of the two, called round to Mamie and told her that the rent would be going up by £4 a month. Mamie only paid £15 a month at the time, so this was a pretty big hike, and Mamie was livid. She refused to pay and decided to tell her landlady to stuff it and that she'd only pay by court order. And then, on the 16th of April, she sat herself down and wrote a letter to the Revenue Commission about the whole thing. Rather than just outline the current dispute with her landlords, which she had a pretty good case for, she decided to write a tirade, telling the tax collectors about every wrong that had ever been done to her. It's here we learn of Mamie's accusation against Larry Doyle, Ellen Thompson's employer, who she said had attempted to perform an abortion on the poor woman himself. She went on to accuse a local priest of fathering a child that was abandoned in Dunshockland in 1938. She was furious. She signed off the letter with the phrase, quote, Irish landlords, if he comes in here to put me out, I will shoot him dead, and also put the butcher knife to the handle in his pot belly. She put the scathing missive in an envelope and sent it by registered post to the castle. On Tuesday morning, she received a notice to quit from her landlords. She was being evicted. That evening, Mamie answered the door to Helen O'Reilly a few minutes after 8pm. Helen was by this time five months pregnant, and started off by handing over the money that she had brought Mamie, and as was her usual method at this stage, began injecting a mix of water and Jay's fluid into Helen's womb in order to abort the pregnancy. It was difficult given the late stage, made worse by Mamie's arthritic hands, and probably her foul mood given the day's events. And Mamie made a mistake. She probably had difficulty keeping the plunger going, and at some point, a bubble of air formed in the apparatus and travelled into Helen's womb and into her bloodstream, causing an embolism. Helen died instantly. Mamie was in deep trouble, and she wasn't able to do anything about it either, given her own frailty and ill health. She needed help, so she called Standish O'Grady, who she had protected in the past. Grudgingly, he came in the cover of darkness to help Mamie transport Helen's body out into the street. They managed to get her two doors down and laid her on the path there next to the basement entrance to number 15. Then Standish left, and Mamie gathered the rest of Helen's things from her room, her purse and so on, and covered Helen's body with the smart black coat she had arrived in. The street was pretty much empty and was gaslit at the time. People who had business there in the early hours of the morning did not notice the body lying there. No one noticed until Patrick Leeson, the milkman, arrived at five past five on the Wednesday morning. He saw what he thought was a bundle of clothes lying there, and he didn't go to inspect it as he was running late. A number of people passed by that morning, some seeing the bundle and some who didn't notice it. Patrick Rigney was a milkman as well, and he had passed by Hume Street at about twenty past six. He was driving his truck along the green and saw the bundle lying in Hume Street. Later, he would say that he saw a woman stooping over the bundle, and was somehow also able to give a detailed description of the woman, despite the split second that he would have had to see her. He said then a few minutes later that they drove down Hume Street itself to make a delivery, and when he got to the bundle, he saw that it was in fact the body of a woman with a black coat draped over her. In another version of his story, he said he also heard a noise from a basement flat and looked down into the cellar area, where he saw a fair woman with glasses looking back at him. After the discovery, Patrick Rigney said he continued on his rounds before heading to Baggett Street and reporting the find to Garda Timothy Fallon. The Garda arrived at the scene and found Helen lying there, half in the gate of the basement of number 15 and half on the path. She was covered with a coat, thankfully, because under that her skirt was rucked up around her, exposing her torn underwear, which were tied to her legs above the knee. A scarf and a stocking were tied around her neck in a bow. Both of her stockings were in disarray, and it was obvious from the marks on her clothing and body that she had been dragged into that position. Quickly, more and more Gardee began to arrive on scene as it was cordoned off, drawing even very senior members out to Hume Street. With them, a crowd also gathered, a crowd that was already quite sure what had happened and was calling for vengeance. 
at about ten past eight, Mamie decided she needed to see exactly what was going on outside, and she came down to the step of number 17. When the crowd saw her, they screamed at her. There she is, there's the murderer. She turned on her heel and went back inside with no reaction to the scene whatsoever. About ten minutes later, Dr. Moore's Hickey, the state pathologist, arrived at Hume Street. First off, he took the temperature of the body and estimated the air temperature at the time was in and around 18 degrees Celsius. Quite high for an April morning. Quite high for any morning, even at the height of summer. Helen's identity was pretty clear from the contents of her purse. She was still carrying her bank book, but she would be formally identified by her brother-in-law that afternoon. When Dr. Hickey carried out the autopsy, he examined Helen's heart and found that the right chamber was badly damaged and he found air bubbles in it. He also found that there was a five-month-old male fetus present in the womb. The sac containing the child was not damaged, but about two-thirds of it was separated from the wall of the womb, and it appeared ragged in places, indicating that the separation was not natural. There was also a distinct smell of disinfectant. However, there was no damage to the womb or cervix. Up until the air embolism, this had been a good job, he said, requiring a skilled practitioner. His official conclusion was that Helen had died from an air embolism that had entered her bloodstream through her womb during an abortion procedure. Assuming that the body had been placed outside in the cold only at 6am or so that morning, he estimated the time of death as around 9pm the night before. The morning that Helen's body was found, two guardi, egged on by the gathered crowd, called up to Mamie at about a quarter past eight that morning. She answered the door in her red robe and asked them to come in. She pretended to have no idea what was going on, and when the guardi told her that a woman's body had been found, she responded, quote, Oh, it must have been a man that did that. Smooth, Mamie. The phone rang when they were there too, and when Mamie answered it, all she would say was, Yes, 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 I'll do that for you. There's a suspicion that it was Standish calling to find out if Helen's body had been found yet. She showed the men her bandaged legs from her varicose veins and told them all about her arthritis, proving to them what an infirm old woman she was. These were just the first of the Gardaí to appear at Mamie's door that day. There would be a parade of them in and out for the rest of the day. They searched her flat and found a number of medical instruments, a specula, a Hickson syringe, and forceps. These were removed under a search warrant along with Mamie's diary and her dressing gown. Years later, in the flat next door to Mamie's, students would find two further boxes of medical instruments hidden away, possibly secreted there by Mamie when her neighbour was out, and without her neighbour's knowledge. But this early on, there was no real physical evidence connecting Mamie with Helen's death, despite basically everyone condemning the woman as being responsible. But Mamie didn't care. She knew there was no direct evidence, and only became more defiant in the face of public ridicule of her. The Gardaí were all too happy to try and give the mob what they wanted, though, and the technical bureau was sent into the tiny room to try and put Helen O'Reilly there the night of her death. That would have to do to put Mamie back in the dock, and once she was there, she would no doubt be convicted. So fibres, dust, hairs, anything was what they were now looking for. It was the most detailed forensic investigation that they had ever attempted. They needed anything, no matter how small, to connect the body to Mamie's flat, or Mamie's flat to the woman. Mamie wasn't quiet while this investigation was going on. If the guardie thought that she might keep her head down, then they'd be wrong. She decided to give interviews to the newspapers. She had a great time altogether, but didn't particularly endear herself to the public nor did she use the opportunity to try and get the mob off her back. Mamie did what Mamie always did, and inflamed things further. She said that the public were just jealous of the money she had, and that the women who came to see her were whores. Just over a week after Helen's body was found, the guardie returned to Mamie's flat to question her. They told her that they had evidence against her, witnesses. She was cautioned, and asked about a man that had been seen with her the night Helen's body was dumped on Hume Street. She insisted it was an alpha up from the country for a cure from her, and refused to give his name, but it's pretty clear from the description that they gave her that it was Standish she was seen with. In fairness, she was quite insistent about this other mysterious client. She refused to give Standish up. The guardie searched the flat again and took more items, a couple of Mamie's combs, an enamel douche can, some lamps, and a large safety pin. The guardie left again, but later they turned up, and in a surprise move, they arrested Mamie. But not for anything to do with the death of Helen O'Reilly. Instead, they took her in for writing a threatening letter to her landlords. She got herself dressed up for the photographers that waited outside for her, a nice fur coat with a gold buckle and a matching fur hat, and a crocodile skin handbag. She had a reputation to keep up, I guess. She was charged in the district court and sent off to Mountjoy, yet again. As soon as all the reports were in from the Gardee, Mamie was charged with the murder of Helen O'Reilly on the 26th of May, 1956. A quick note before we continue. It may appear that if Mamie was to be charged with the circumstances surrounding Helen O'Reilly's death, that it was accidental, and therefore at best manslaughter. However, the law in Ireland at the time, which is still currently in place, I'll talk a bit about that at the end, is the 1861 Offences Against the Person Act. The act describes anyone procuring or performing an abortion as having committed a felony. And so, if death occurs in the middle of that procedure, murder charges could be pursued. By this time, even the law in England had moved on from this, having a looser interpretation of what quote-unquote unlawful meant in relation to the procedure. This was after the Bourne Judgment, where a doctor had performed an abortion on a 13-year-old who'd been gang-raped by soldiers. 
and so in England, abortion in cases where the health or life of the mother was a risk was allowed. This was not the case in Ireland, so it was a murder charge that Mamie faced now. Mamie assembled her legal team. Her solicitor in this case was young Stanley Sieve, assisted by Ernest Wood as senior counsel and Noel Hartnett as junior. It was an ecumenical lineup, with her lawyers each from a different background, excepting of course the most common and most problematic, a Roman Catholic. For the state was Dermot Bell, senior counsel, and James Ryan, barrister at law. The trial was held in the old Green Street courthouse, the one equipped to carry out hangings, though its gallows had not been used in some time. As per usual, the place was packed out to see the trial, and despite the fact that only a few people could nab seats inside, the crowd waited outside, specifically to scream abuse at Mamie. Hang the bitch was a favourite. Justice Richard McLaughlin was presiding, a man who had been on the bench during the initial abortionist trials of the early 40s, and had been noted for his harsh sentences. When Mamie arrived, she was back in her fur coat, with a silk headscarf this time. She had green-tinted glasses and a magnifying glass. She made a show of the fact that she couldn't stand in court, and was allowed to sit throughout. In Bell's opening, he outlined for the jury the items that had been found in Mamie's flat, and that there was evidence of recent use of them, despite Mamie's protestations. Fingerprints and blood were found on the instruments that she said she hadn't used since she owned the nursing home over ten years before. They were just exactly the sort of pieces of equipment required to carry out the procedure that the tragic Ellen O'Reilly had died of. Then a scale model of Mamie's flat, the surrounding houses, and Hume Street was presented to the court. Mamie's diary was also presented to the court and showed appointments that she had made, but that carried no names. People were identified by the clothing that they would be wearing when they arrived to the doorstep. For the 17th of April, an entry read, 8pm, black coat. This was despite the attempt to alter the entry before the diary was seized. The next day, 32 witnesses were called, and Helen's last trip to Dublin and her movements in the city were described to the jury. Mamie's landlords gave evidence, along with the other tenants of 17 Hume Street. Mary Farrelly, a neighbour, gave evidence that she had heard a dragging sound, like furniture being moved around the night of the death, something that she had failed to mention early on in the investigation. Day three saw evidence from Patrick Rigney, the man who found the body. He told the court that he had seen a woman crouched over the body, and in the split second he would have seen this figure as he glanced up the street, he said he was able to see that she had glasses, had white clothing on of some sort, and was of stocky build. He then told the court about spotting a woman, looking up at him from the basement of number 15 when he went over to the body, and that that woman had blonde hair and glasses. The jury were told that Mr. Rigney hadn't mentioned this woman in the basement in his initial story to the Gardee, and were also told that in an interview with a newspaper he had said that it was quite bright at 6.25am on an April morning, which is really unlikely, and that he saw no one else around. No man, no one. When Standish O'Grady was called to give evidence, he told the court that he had never met Mamie Catton, and that he had never been anywhere near number 17 Hume Street. It's weird that despite the fact that this guy was positively identified by two separate witnesses putting him in and around number 17 that night, that there were no charges laid against him for assisting Mamie, which was the Gardee's strong suspicion, and they were relying on his presence to make out their case against Mamie, who surely could not have acted alone. No fewer than 13 Gardee were called to give evidence of their dealings with Mamie the morning of the 18th of April. When Garda Michael Sullivan took the stand, he gave evidence of the phone call he had witnessed Mamie taking that morning in the hall of number 17. He said that she appeared to be quite normal, and speaking normally. When asked if he knew her before that day, he responded, Not to see, my lord, implying strongly that Mamie Cadden was quote-unquote known to the Gardee. She had a criminal reputation. At this, her defence team asked for the jury to be excused for an application. Senior counsel Hartnett asked for the jury to be discharged. Evidence had been given of Mamie's previous bad reputation, something that was not allowed. The judge played dumb and said that the Garda had given evidence that the woman had talked normally. When Hartnett asked directly about the not-knowing-to-see-her remark, the judge simply stated that he would not discharge the jury. He was having none of it. On the fifth day of the trial, Dr. Morris Hickey took the stand. He gave evidence of Helen's cause of death. But, more crucially, he told the court of the fibre evidence that was present. He said that, on Helen's body had been found eight hairs, three of which matched a fur cape of Mamie's, and the others, which were dyed blonde and waved, and matched hairs found on Mamie's combs. On Mamie's red dressing gown, two hairs were found, dark, long, and similar in degree of wave to Helen O'Reilly's hair. More hair suspected of being Helen's was found in the stairwell of number 17. There were red fibres found on Helen's overcoat, and Hickey told the court that he thought some of them were from Mamie's red dressing gown. Remember that these were basically eyesight examinations of the hairs. They looked similar, but they were far from conclusive evidence of Helen's presence in Mamie's flat, and of Mamie having contact with the dead woman. He also gave evidence of the temperature of the body when he found it, and described the calculations required to estimate the time of death. But there was a major problem with these calculations. They were wrong. He had recorded the outside temperature on that April morning as 18 degrees Celsius, which is 64 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's basically impossible. We're lucky to get that in May by noon. Nearby, at Leinster House, the temperature had been recorded as 7 degrees that morning, a far more reasonable 44 degrees Fahrenheit. After nine days, the prosecution rested. The defence applied to the judge to have the trial withdrawn for lack of evidence, but of course this was refused. 
The tenth day saw the case of the defense, and their paltry witnesses took to the stand. They had been unable to get a doctor to take the stand and testify to Mamie's physical impairments that would show it would have been impossible for her to move the body herself. They were all too afraid speaking on behalf of Mamie would damage their reputations. No gynecologist would testify either. Those who did testify were all distinctly not Catholic, people who were not part of the men's clubs and societies that basically ran Dublin at the time, under the auspices of the Catholic Church. A Mrs. Mary Brown testified to the extent of Mamie's arthritis. A meteorologist gave evidence of the correct temperature that morning, and Dr. Earl Hackett from TCD gave evidence regarding the fibres. He had collected a random sample of dust and fibres from Eli Place. They all matched, to the same degree, those used in the case against Mamie. He said the fibres were meaningless. He also stated that it was impossible to tell how old a bloodstain was once it had dried, contradicting evidence regarding the forceps Mamie said she hadn't used since her Rathgar days. When the defence summed up, they pointed out the problems with the physical evidence and the inconsistency with the witness statements presented at trial. In a final attempt to plant reasonable doubt, her junior counsel stated that, given the paucity of actual evidence, was it not likely that the body of the poor woman had been dumped on Hume Street by yet another abortionist who knew of Nurse Cadden and her reputation, banking on the idea that quickly a connection would be made to Mamie and that she would get the blame for the death? There was no connection to Mamie from the extra stocking found around Helen's neck. Mamie was incapable of moving a body anyway, and a fingerprint was found on Helen's umbrella that didn't match her or Mamie. He said there wasn't enough evidence to hang a dog, let alone his client. The prosecution stood next and remarkably said that Mr. Rigney had identified Mamie as the woman he saw, which was not the case. The defence yet again asked for the jury to be discharged here. The judge denied that Mr. Ryan prosecuting had said anything of the sort and refused again to call a mistrial. He did, however, say he would ask the jury to disregard counsel's last comment, which, incidentally, he never did. Justice McLaughlin summed up by explaining the charge and said that on the evidence he thought that the jury must find that Helen O'Reilly had died as a result of procuring an abortion procedure and that therefore some person caused this death, which was a felony. Pretty straightforward. There had been an abortion, no doubt. Helen had died, and this was a felony, no doubt. All the jury needed now was an abortionist. They were told that they could find someone guilty on circumstantial evidence, so long as the facts were inconsistent with any other explanation. The men of the jury retired at half-seven that night and returned to ask if there was any other verdict open to the jury on the count before them. That is, must they find Mamie guilty or not guilty of murder only, or was there some other compromise option? They were told no. There was no other option open to them. So at 8.45, they returned again with a verdict of guilty. When asked, had Mamie anything to say in response to the verdict, she responded, quote, You will never do it. This is not my country. I am reporting this to the president of my country. This is the third time I am convicted in my country falsely, and I will report it, and I will see about it at a later date. Thank you. Only for my counsel, I would say something you wouldn't like to hear. End quote. The judge then placed a black cap on his head and sentenced Mamie to death, to be carried out on the 21st of November, 1956, by hanging. When he finished the customary speech with the words, and may the Lord have mercy on your soul, Mamie, now no longer able to contain herself, spat out, well, I'm not a Catholic. Take that now. Leave to appeal the sentence of death was requested and refused. Mamie was brought back to Mount Joy through a jubilant mob to await her execution. Her legal team began preparing to bring her appeal to the Court of Criminal Appeal, and Mamie, meanwhile, stewed in her anger. She lashed out at just about everyone and basically had no more fucks to give. In the appeal, they cited misdirection on the part of the judge and that there was not enough evidence to support the guilty verdict. Most importantly, they argued that the judge had been wrong when he told the jury that they could not return a verdict of manslaughter. When the appeal was lodged, so was an application for free legal aid. Mamie was finally out of cash. Legal aid and leave to appeal was granted on the 23rd of November, 1956. Chief Justice Connor McGuire delivered judgment on the 24th of December. He did not accept Mamie's arguments. Mamie's hanging was now to take place on the 10th of January, 1957. In a last-ditch attempt, Stanley Sieve asked for the matter of whether the judge was allowed to preclude a verdict of manslaughter in such cases be referred to the Supreme Court, as he argued that there was a lack of clarity in the law in this matter. A woman had not been hanged in Ireland since 1925, but given the public sentiment towards Mamie at this point, her going to the gallows was a distinct possibility. The Attorney General sought advice from his department about the legal question, and the result of that was taking into account modern legal thought in England, manslaughter may actually have been an option. But if they followed precedent from previous cases, then the judge was correct. So no clear answer there. They were covering their asses. All that was left to them now was that Mamie might be granted a reprieve. But very few people were willing to speak on her behalf, never mind write letters of petition to the government. Only one member of the Oireachtas, Senator Owen Sheehy Skeffington, wrote to the Taoiseach. The Irish Association of Civil Liberties was the only organisation that lobbied for a commutation for Mamie Cadden. Her lawyer also wrote on her behalf, telling the government that Mamie was of, quote, abnormal mentality, end quote, along with about 70 signatures of those who also wanted to see that Mamie was not hanged. On the 4th of January, the government granted the reprieve. 
Mamie would not hang. She was to spend the rest of her life in penal servitude. Despite her age and how bloody cantankerous she was, she was made to carry out the work expected of her under her sentence until she was mysteriously declared insane in 1958 and moved to the criminal lunatic asylum in Dundrum, as it was known then. Everyone has pretty much agreed that she wasn't insane, but it may be that she had become terminally ill and was transferred there as a bit of a mercy for the old and infirm woman. It may also be that they wanted shot of her at Mount Joy. We can't know now because all of the official records regarding Mamie have been misplaced by the various organisations that were to hold on to them. Nurse Cadden passed away peacefully in Dundrum on the 20th of April 1959. Mamie Cadden lived in a time where her chosen profession was nearly unanimously reviled by the Irish public and their authorities, until, of course, someone required her particular services. She was vain, conceited and elitist, and enjoyed the power that her position and reputation as a nurse, midwife and abortionist gave her. Hers is not a story of an evil woman, a baby killer, but nor is it a story of a feminist heroine. She was certainly a woman of her time. Often, the women that she helped, she herself scorned and treated with contempt. She was no charity worker. But her story does highlight that there is no such thing as an abortion-free country, only illegal and therefore unsafe abortions. Irish society was so tightly controlled by the church that things actually got worse for women after the 1950s. After Roe v. Wade in the US in 1973 and the McGee case here in 1974 established that there was in fact a right to privacy, the conservative right had a complete freak out that something like the laws following Roe v. Wade could end up here, and the ban on abortion in the good Catholic country of the Republic of Ireland was actually enshrined into our constitution. You'll know all about that if you follow me on Twitter. This law effectively removed bodily autonomy from pregnant people in the country, no abortions in any circumstances, and no need to get consent for any procedures carried out during pregnancy if it was in the best interest of the fetus. That was in 1983. This year, a whopping two-thirds of the public who voted in a referendum decided to be rid of this law, which had killed women experiencing miscarriages or requiring life-saving cancer treatment, or forced women whose babies were diagnosed with fatal fetal conditions over to England to deliver their angels. About 5,000 abortions are performed on Irish women each year, most in England or in Holland, and some illegally in their own homes, using pills bought online. This still continues today, while the legal cases against the referendum make their way through the courts and the legislation is prepared. The support for the removal of the Eighth Amendment was personally overwhelming, and something that I'm still not over, a couple of months on. It feels like a long time since Mamie Cadden drove through the Dublin streets in her little MG, since Joanne Hines was interrogated about who she slept with and when, since a girl was refused permission to travel to the UK after being raped, since Savita died of sepsis in Galway since a young refugee woman was forced to have a C-section. It may be that now our little republic is finally becoming just that. Thank you for listening to the Men's Right Podcast. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe, rate, and review in Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter at Men's Rayapod, and you can get in contact by emailing mensrayapod at gmail.com. I'd like to take a moment to thank our supporters on Patreon. Your support means a lot, and it helps to cover some of the costs of the productions of the show. Thank you to some of our recent patrons, Laura R. and Sue Mary Moreau. There are some nice little perks there, including bonus content available and some swag. So if you can drop some change in the collection basket, feel free. Our theme song is Quinn's song, First Dance by Kevin MacLeod, with thanks to Rona McHugh for help with sound engineering. Next time, we'll be back in Ireland, headed into one of the most infamous and shocking crimes of the 1990s. Till then... Don't do anything I wouldn't do. An inflammation of the abdominal ab, of the abdom an inflammation an inflammation of the abdominal 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 an inflammation of the abdominal wall abdominal an inflammation of the abdominal abdominal an inflammation of the abdominal wall an inflammation of the abdominal of the abdominal, of the...